I want to welcome everybody uh, to this first seminar of the Black Lives Matter Day celebration here at UMass Boston. Uh, my name is Steve Neville. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. Um, and uh, I work uh, over in the side of the campus that deals with um, student multicultural affairs, student leadership and community engagement, and you access. Uh, I want to welcome you all uh, to this session uh, where we're going to be uh, addressing the Black Lives Matter movement, looking at it um, uh, from a uh, somewhat historical uh, perspective and gaining some understanding about <clears throat> where this movement came from and how it came about. I'm here today uh, uh, hosting this session with uh, Dr. Tony Vandermeer, um, who, who is an activist and a scholar, organizer and teacher, who's been teaching uh, for the past 25 years at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, he's a senior lecturer in the Africana Studies Department, <clears throat> very well known to the campus. Uh, he was an African American Studies major uh, during his undergrad years at, at, at Northeastern University. Uh, and he received his uh, Master of Science degree in Community Economic Development uh, from the Graduate School of Business at New Hampshire College. And he received his uh, MA and PhD in Leadership and Change from Antioch University. <clears throat> uh, he served as the president of the Boston Black Political Task Force and the Boston Pan-African Forum. And he has also served as, an, as a local advisor to the Boston Black Lives Matter movement. So he comes today with quite a bit of experience in, in social activism and Black activism in, in, in the community uh, and naturally and nationally as well as on, on our campus. Uh, so I wanna welcome uh, Dr. Tony Vandermeer uh, to our session this morning. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. I kind of um, <clears throat> envisioned this as a, um, as, a, as a bit of a dialogue. And so uh, I have some questions uh, that I'd like to start this session off and, and, and direct to Dr. Vandermeer and, the, and, and give him an opportunity to sort of help us put this day and this movement in, in perspective. So I figured I'd start at the beginning and ask, uh, uh, Dr. Vandermeer, if he could just um, help to explain this contemporary Black Lives Matter movement. Let's start there. Well, thanks, Steve. Um, and I appreciate it, uh, um, you know, being involved with this, uh, um, this new proclamation uh, that the uh, Chancellor made on uh, making the, the first Monday of November uh, Black Lives Matter Day. Uh, I have to say uh, that um, historically, um, November, which is uh, one part of uh, the uh, Black social movement, had been Black Solidarity Day that started in New York by Carlos Russell. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I remember uh, when I was a student, and also I was an organizer for the National Black Student Association uh, that was founded at Tufts University in 76. And um, we actually took uh, buses uh, to New York. Uh, we had a, a National Black Human Rights Rally in, uh, in 1979 um, as part of Black Solidarity Day, um, you, mm. know, uh, you know, which had about maybe 8,000 people uh, there. Uh, and that was the, one of the, this, this, the I think the, the day that it was announced that Asada Shakur, who was with the Black Panther Party, had escaped from prison in New Jersey. But I want to I want to show something to you because I don't know if people can see this. Uh, this is a a, a poster um, that says National Black Student Association, but we presented a Black Solidarity Weekend. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, some of the people on there. This was in 1978. Uh, there was uh, a Skia Ture, uh, a Sonia Sanchez, and Skia Ture was one of the founders of Black Studies program in California, in San Francisco, as well as one of the um, uh, founding members uh, um, of the Black Arts Movement, along with Sonia Sanchez and, of course, Donna Lee there. 
um, and uh, as well as he was also involved in SNCC, you know, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the 60s. But you also see Athena Shakur, mm -hmm. who was Tupac's mother, who we brought to uh, Boston. This is which Tupac might have been like six years old or something during that time and doing it. I'm saying all that is to say that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is a continuation of the historical resistance of Black oppression. Um, and uh, that uh, we have to look at what has happened in terms of how movements have been disconnected or, or, or broken up. You know, uh, of course, there's, there's a, a, um, the COINTEL program, which the counterintelligence program with the U.S. government played a role in destroying uh, Black uh, freedom movements, Black liberation movements. Uh, and so you have periods where there's a high point, a low point, but it just doesn't go back to the 60s. In fact, we have to even go back to uh, the, the uh, 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 Dred Scott decision, because when you talk about Black Lives Matter and you don't deal with historical precedent and legal precedents in which the Supreme Court said Black men had no rights that white men were bound to respect, right? That was a Supreme Court decision. Uh, and, and this was in the light of, uh, be, you know, uh, before the beginning of the Civil War and dealing with a slave state and, 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 and free state, uh, that that decision was made because of uh, a Dred, uh, uh, um, Dred Scott uh, uh, said that because he lived in a free state that he was actually free. Um, but at the time uh, that when that had uh, happened, you were going towards the Civil War, which eventually produced uh, the Emancipation Proclamation from, from Lincoln and then the Radical Republicans that put out the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, right, which abolished slavery, and then it, it, it made Black people citizens, and then the 15th gave Black men the right to, you know, men the right to vote, okay? So, but it said that Black people were, you know, uh, had no legal rights. They were considered dissidents, and before they were nine persons. But even before that, from the African people that were captured or even traded, you know, they resisted as soon as they were captured, when they were getting on ships, when they were on ships, when they got off of ships, when they were on plantations, did they resist it? They, their action, their resistance said that Black Lives Matter. Now here's the, the, the real funny part about it. Because if Black lives don't matter, the truth of the matter is no lives matter. Why? Because you know, it was through Black lives, it was through African people that created a, a civilization and that all of us have a shared common ancestry. And so the notion of inferior and superior is co completely wrong, that white people are not superior and Black people are not inferior, that we share common ancestry. And it's important for this university and other universities to understand uh, uh, this important fact so that we could be, begin to see our connectedness versus how we separate as if we're these different races, you know. Now, yes, different ethnicities, but that we are come from the same source, and that's important. So the modern Black Lives Matter is about the, the historical continuation of Black oppression and Black people who are resisting that oppression saying Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Um, so on, on, on the, the base of, the, of that, um, one of the things that I've, um, I've noticed and, and seen and heard from a number of people who have, you know, been doing analysis of this movement recently is, um, you know, they, they, they've noted that uh, the movement is, is, is very much an interracial movement. Um, the fact of, you know, seeing both nationally and around the world, uh, large numbers of, of, of white people who have uh, come out and protested and demonstrated uh, with that movement. And so I'd ask, you know, how can we account for the, the, the massive number of white people that have been involved in this Black Lives Matter movement? So that's, that requires a complex analysis, um, um, Steve. But what we have to also understand that uh, this type of movement is not new. 
Um, and that there's a, uh, a book that's important, and I want to start with this, I'll show it to you. It's called The Invention of the White Race, right? <laughs> and um, by Theodore Allen. It's a two volume series. And so when African people were brought here, uh, they also uh, were brought here, uh, you know, as enslaved people, and that they had brought, Europe had sent over uh, 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 Irish people and Scottish people who became white because in order to create this difference with black people, you had to make, you had to create the opposite. Um, and, but they, they had legal rights. But even before that, even as adventure service, but even before that, that there were relationships between those Africans, you know, and, 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 and those uh, whites during that time. But even uh, during the abolitionist period, you know, you had, uh, you know, black people obviously were abolitionists, they wanted freedom, but you had white abolitionists, the Garrisonians, the Libertarians, uh, you know, uh, and so forth, people who supported um, uh, uh, Martin Delaney, people who supported Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman uh, and so forth. Um, and, and so you had uh, that intersection. Uh, but it's also important that, you know, after uh, doing Reconstruction, uh, that you had this uh, this segregated process beginning, and but you always had a a, a more you, you 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 develop a nationalist movement. There, there's a book that's very important by Sterling Stuckey, right? And you know it's nationalist theory of the foundation of Black America, where it talks about uh, how it created this national culture, therefore a national a movement, therefore a national liberation uh, movement uh, that produced. Uh, uh, you know, people like uh, Elijah Muhammad with the Nation of Islam, it produced, you know, Malcolm X, who saw it important that uh, Black people need to organize among themselves to, to do that. But at the same time, you had a more, a more multiracial movements, the NAACP, for example, you know, uh, you know, the Urban League, uh, uh, you know, and so forth. So you always had uh, 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 progressive whites who supported, uh, you know, a Black struggle, but the difference in self-determination is when people begin to determine for themselves, you know, their agency and what it is that they want versus uh, assimilating into a society where that's happening. But for the immediate uh, uh, development of this movement, that you have to uh, look at Occupy Wall Street. You have to look at the Bernie Sanders phenomena uh, in which uh, this period had radicalized uh, 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 particularly young whites in the society. Uh, and so that 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 after you know Bernie or after Wall you know occupied Wall Street that they've been the, uh, to uh, um, uh, galvanize around you know some of the black social movements and particularly development of, of Black Lives Matter. I want to say uh, in terms of Black Lives Matter that the World Social Forums was happening around 2007 2008, and I was in Atlanta and uh, actually uh, Patrice Coolis, uh, Alicia Gaza was there. In fact, I had did a um, I did a uh, a, uh, uh, was doing a documentary on black activism. And I interviewed Alicia and also Patricia. In fact, I met Patricia out in uh, California when I was teaching a course in 206 at, U at UCLA on civil rights movement. Um, and so they also participated and uh, there was a group, people who came out of the 60s in terms of the black liberation movement, the civil rights movement, uh, who was trying to consolidate this period in order to move forward. These were young people, Alicia and Patricia at the time, who participated um, and who came to some of the gatherings that we had in North Carolina and so forth. Um, in fact, Alicia has a new book out in which she talks about her experience uh, in Atlanta. In fact, I have some disagreements with her description of that experience, right? And so forth. But this was at a, a, a social forum that was mixed, but it was forces within the Black liberation can trying to consolidate that and push that forward. Uh, so, uh, but I think uh, considering where we are after Barack Obama, you know, with Donald Trump, is that you, you see more whites uh, are joining and trying to participate in these movements, therefore creating, you know, more of a multiracial uh, 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 context, you know, to, to the, the, current, uh, uh, the, the current movement. But don't get it wrong, is that there's still a nationalist undercurrent uh, that's involved and there's some, there are some, uh, some ideological uh, 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 differences 
that's taking place, particularly in the black, uh, you know, in, in the, within the uh, the black movement, so to speak. Um, but it's a good thing, right? Because the question of how do you radicalize the conscience of white people to recognize that they do share shared ancestry, you know, uh, that we all share shared an, an, uh, ancestry, and that we're going to have to fight together. But it's also how do we create a democracy, or can we create a democracy as a multiracial society? So it, it also raises questions, but it's an important movement right now for us to, to look at uh, and to evaluate and see how we could build that, that level of unity in order to transforming this society, considering what we've been dealing with with the past four years with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, you know, as we, as as you as as you say, you know this this whole movement is really wrestling with the question of you know with the question of democracy and and how do we make democracy active? Um, one of the questions that arises out of that for me is how do we make sense of all of this within academic institutions like UMass Boston and particularly institutions like like this one that serve. Uh, large numbers of students, faculty, and staff who come from communities that have that come from communities that have been marginalized. Well, this is the point of the Sankofa conversation series uh, mm -hmm. to begin a process. But for those who are, are watching now, and if they paid attention to the second Sankofa uh, uh, a conversation, they would have heard Dr. Cuff Ferguson, who said, "What we're trying to do is not new." And that he talked about CPCS, the College of, of, of Public and Community Service, who were, who were trying to do some of these things, who actually had uh, agreements with um, uh, community groups, that went in the community, did classes in the community, uh, you know, and so forth. But it's about creating a, a different paradigm around education, around knowledge production. Uh, but it's also a question of power, right? Uh, and where power resides and how power is executed. Uh, and so, but, it, it, but the whole idea of why we use the word Sankofa, because it's a reflective process. It's like, in order to move forward, we have to go back, you know, and, we, and when we go back, we have to look at what was done. We also have to repair. And it's about shared governance. It's about, you know, uh, 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 sharing power. But, you know, the truth of the matter is that people just don't give up power. You got to wrestle with it. This is what Dr. King taught us. That you have to keep people accountable in terms of dealing with power. So the university is in a critical position right now. We have a new chance that we're going to have a new provost. The College of Liberal Arts is going to have a new dean. So we're dealing with this paradigm shift. And we got to figure out how to organize ourselves in a way uh, in which we're going to recognize uh, the, the equality of all of us. You know, and that we have to have an institution that deals with equity and fairness uh, and not based on one's, you know, uh, complexion or gender or class status. Um, but that's something all of us have to do, that we have to look at the structure that's in, that already exists and how those structures create barriers uh, that uh, impedes the, the, um, the development of all of our potentials, whether it's students, whether it's staff, whether it's faculty, uh, and so forth. And so we're at a, a very important historical point to re-examine not only what was done, but how do we innovate in order to move forward in terms of trying to look at the power dynamics and power relationship that exist in academic institutions, and particularly a public academic institution, because it's just not what we do within our own campus environment, and it also has to deal with the external forces. For example, we got a system where you have a president and then you have, you know, a chancellor. But you also have a board of trustees. Who are they? How do they get in that position? How do they reflect the communities we come from? Then you have the legislature, which we have to deal with, who have to be accountable to the people because this is public funds. Is that how are they letting things go down where they have almost a, a quasi privatization going on with people who come from corporations sitting on our board of trustees. So there's a deep transformational process that has to happen on our campus with, with the kind of unity that will deal with the board of directors that would also deal with uh, the uh, legislative uh, aspect of, of government in Massachusetts. Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, what, what, what power dynamics always uh, sort of uh, raise uh, to, to mind for me are these various uh, ways of uh, that, that domination has taken place in, in our society over, over time. Um, 
And, and to that end, you know, just wrestling with the question of, of class struggle, which has, you know, been a longstanding reality of Western culture and civilization. And I guess, in, you know, in, in the, one of the questions that I would ask here is, in, you know, in what ways has the, the, the codification of race into law um, and into statute or into policy really confounded uh, this class struggle that has always been there? And, and in what ways does it continue to do so? Um, uh, probably and perhaps without really being noticed by most people. Well, the truth of the matter is that we live in a capitalist society mm -hmm. and the people who have wealth, you know, pretty much dictate the, you know, the lay of the land. It, they influence policies and, and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And so, you know, uh, people say this is a democracy, but it's democracy of the people who have all the wealth because they're the ones who can influence that more so than anybody, you know, laws in, in, more than uh, anyone. So this is, you know, so the question is that we have to push to make the, the kind of democracy work that, that, that's in place, or we have to change it, right? Um, but I think that uh, for us at the university is that, you know, we have unions, we have uh, uh, agreements, bargaining agreements, uh, and so forth. And that uh, we can't say we're just going to do something, but let's codify it. Let's put it in those agreements. You know, let's create a structure uh, that calls for equity across the board. Because see, even, even the way that we, that, that we run the institutions, the way you have uh, associate lecturers, uh, you have a lecturer, senior lecturers, assistant professors, uh, you know, associate professors, you have professors. That structure in itself is a hierarchy. It's a class structure, right? Uh, which in some ways box you in where you can't appreciate the value of other, other people. You create these divisions, you know, among, you know, people's work and so forth. So, you know, to, to talk about a class of society is a lot of work. But it's one where we have to create a society or an environment in which we respect the work, the labor, the contributions, the thinking, uh, and so forth of, of people, but also recognizing that there are many ways of knowing things, you know, that it's, it's, it, and this is the point, that you have people at a university with PhDs, but yet, you know, how is it that we still have a type of structural, you know, uh, structural institutional racism, you know, structural racism that exists, you know, not outside, but also in our, in our campus, that you have faculty member, you know, uh, uh, faculty members who can't relate to, to people who are, who are, who are, who are, who are non-white, right? And that's not, you know, uh, sort of, you know, boldly and directly, and sometimes it is, uh, but it's a question of what they're understanding outside of their perceptional knowledge or their reality or their knowledge base, understanding that there are many ways of knowing things and that you have to be sensitive to other uh, groups of people uh, and so forth. But, you know, so there are different, you know, castes as well as, you know, a class uh, a stratification, uh, but we have to create uh, um, a documents or agreements on campus to say, this is how we're going to function. So in many ways, uh, you know, I think the faculty, the staff, you know, th that have unions have to really push in those unions to make sure that these agreements, you know, are within those contracts versus allowing people to, you know, arbitrarily set policies and make decisions, you know, based on their own interpretation and thinking. This is why it's important, particularly around the, the Supreme Court, because, you know, people will put people on the Supreme Court based on their ideological persuasions, and then, you know, and they're going to interpret the law the way they have power to do so. So we got to change the power structure, but we have to play a role in that process as staff, as faculty, as students, as community people, because this is a public institution. Yeah, we have some we have some real re envisioning to do around uh, you know the ways that we can begin to do this uh, so that so that we can address things structurally, um, and I imagine that's going to be a, a a very difficult. Uh, but 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 in the in the in the long run, a, a rewarding a rewarding process. Um, I guess there's one other concern that arises from that, uh, and, and I think also stands in the way of people being able to envision uh, something different. Um, the, the common response of those who oppose this Black Lives Matter movement 
uh, is this cry of all lives matter. Uh, the critique, it, it, it does speak to the reality uh, of something you've, you've, you've mentioned already, and that is the reality of our common ancestry. The fact that we do come from, from a, a common place and a common space and a common people. But aside from the political motivation, um, what, is it, what is it about the notion of our common ancestry that the all lives matter critique misses or, or, or undermines? Well, that, that, that involves uh, our understanding of, of history, you know, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, African people didn't just book, uh, you know, a 747 flight to come to the, the you know, to, uh, to Latin America, South America, you know, North America, right, you know, or went on a boat cruise, uh, that we have to understand the system uh, that was in, in place. Uh, that created uh, these particular differences, you know, and again, you know, I'll refer to the invention of the, the white, the, you know, uh, of, of, of the white, uh, white people and so forth, the white race, but also I, I think another good book is Walter Rodney, How Europe and Developed Africa, uh, mm -hmm. for, so we can uh, get an understanding, you know, of how this, uh, some of this division has happened, you know, by looking at the, the, the uh, economic, uh, um, uh, systems that were in place, communalism, feudalism, you know, capitalism and so forth. Uh, and who, you know, what was the leadership of those formations and how, how did we get to where we are today? So it is true, the truth of the matter is that all life does matter, but in this, the system that we live in is that, but, you know, black lives hasn't been mattering. I mean, you know, whenever you can turn on the TV or the news, you know, almost on a daily basis and you watch you know, the, the brutality, the, the, the murder, the insanity of what's going on to, to, you know, to black people, innocent black people, by the way, uh, and, and yet you don't hear strong voices uh, calling it out, uh, that you don't, you know, when you see an inequitable system that exists on campus, particularly on our campus, for example, that all faculty should be talking about you know, uh, having equity for everybody, but you know, people develop their privileges and and and, and perks and you know, in the class position that they you know they 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 enjoy and not willing to uh, to give up. But you know, the the truth of the matter is uh, that all lives won't matter until you know, black lives matter because it is this is uh, the 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 um, uh, in terms of uh, the the uh, DNA. You know, when we go to the DNA, we say that we're, we're all connected and we have to begin to respect, uh, uh, you know, black lives. We have to respect black people, we have to respect black leadership. Now, now, the truth of the matter is that I don't care who you are, you know, what family, what group you come from, there is no all good and there's no all bad, right? You know, and we have to balance that. Uh, but to characterize, you know, whiteness is a blessing from God and blackness is something that the devil sent to us, you know, it's completely uh, ridiculous. And we have to, we have to transform that, uh, you know, immediately. Otherwise we're, you know, as, as James Baldwin said, you know, and the truth of the matter, he said, it's going to be a fire the next time, but it, it's, it's fire this time and it's going to get worse uh, uh, until we figure out how to make it better. Uh, and so we have an awesome task uh, ahead of us to learn how to respect all of humanity. You know, that's our, our task and that's an inclusive process. Uh, and, and that's, you know, based on regardless what, what, what gender, what you look like, what, what class you come from, what country you come from, you know, what language you speak, you know, that we have an opportunity to, to model that at this university. Uh, and it requires sacrifice. It requires people giving up uh, some of the beliefs that they've been holding on to uh, that's in conflict with the rest of humanity. Uh, and so we have to put training in place. This is why uh, we need to do, have undoing racism training for all of the uh, administrators and the faculty and the staff at this university to undo uh, the type of thinking, that, un that kind of racism to create a new uh, or a different way of uh, thinking in harmony and how we're gonna move so that we are conscious about what we do and that we could create accountability what we can do. We can have discussions, difficult discussions about the problems that's happening, not just outside, but in our offices, in our classes, on our campus, 
uh, that we have to be bold and courageous uh, to take this question up. And, uh, and that's very, it's been very difficult, but uh, this is our opportunity that we have to engage in. Dr. Vandermeer, I really appreciate that. Um, and, uh, you know, I appreciate you kind of setting the, setting the, the, the table for this, this conversation. Um, I, I'd like now, um, as we, as we, we consider some of just the foundational thinking with regard to uh, this day. You're on mute, Steve. And the implications, uh, both nationally and, um, and locally, and even on our campus. I'd like to open this conversation up to those of you who have joined us today. Um, if you have uh, any questions or comments that you'd like to uh, bring to this discussion, uh, I'd like to, to, to have that opportunity, uh, offer that opportunity for you now. Uh, you can unmute and, and, and ask your questions at this point. Hi, can you hear me and see me? Good morning. First of all, I'm Ann Malone, a clinical faculty in community health nursing um, at the college and at the university. And first, I just want to thank you very much. You know, those of you who provided the leadership to bring this together in the first two Sankofa conversations. Um, my nursing students are with me here this morning as part of our community health clinical. And we took a look at the City of Boston mayoral proclamation on racism as a public health emergency and the eight strategies that were articulated. And I'm sure that the interim director of the Public Health Commission, Rita Nieves, who's a public health nurse, a wonderful woman, had a lot to do with that language. Um, and how can we as members of the UMass community um, and for myself and my students, the uh, College of Nursing and Health Sciences, kind of take an active role in this work. You know, we read aloud, we took turns, people read paragraphs from the mayor's proclamation on racism as a, a public health emergency. And then a student, you know, people had really good critical thinking responses. And one was, well, these words on paper are powerful, but how are they gonna be turned into action? And so I said, let's go to the workshop and maybe we'll learn some things there and some space as part of the UMass community to, to get some of this work done. So I'm not sure that's a direct question, but if you um, and, and uh, others could respond to that, I'd love to hear ideas or maybe other participants can chime in. Well, I'll, I'll go back to my point about undoing racism um, uh, training, uh, because I think uh, that, you know, it's, it's not just something that has to happen in the Africana Studies Department that we do courses, but it should be something that happens across uh, um, uh, across uh, a discipline, um, whether it's in you know math or science or nursing. Is that in what ways have uh, uh, either have racism reared its ugly head in 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 the, in the health field? So the idea of saying that you know is that public health crisis is a public health crisis. That speaks volumes of what's happening. I mean, what role uh, did uh, the, the abuse of black women play in terms of developing uh, uh, issues around, uh, gyne you know, uh, sort of uh, um, the science around gynecology and, you know, the, the treatment of of, uh, of of black women without any, uh, you know, any 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 any, any in medication or anything? I mean, just the, the abuse, the the, the 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 study on syphilis. What happened to you know the sort of black men? Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, I mean, this, the, the level of racism that is exists in that, and also how are black uh, uh, patients treated in hospitals compared to white patients? You know, what are the disparities? So, if we're undoing racism, we have to uh, hope get people to think different, to deal with their values, their beliefs, their behaviors, and how they apply the knowledge that they have. Uh, so, uh, we have to. So, while the the bottom creates the momentum, but it's momentum, but it's the leadership at the top that has to begin to open that door and say we got to open this door so we could address these issues uh, around it. So I would start with training, but I was also because when you send these students in the community, they go in the community and have contempt for people. They're gonna have a problem, but but the people living in those communities will have problems as well because they're not getting the support or the help 
uh, that they uh, that they need. Uh, so, uh, but I think that the department should be pushing uh, for these trainings. Uh, they should be collaborating with other departments for Africana Studies. And I know uh, uh, your dean Linda has had conversations with us already. So she's she's starting that process, which is wonderful. Uh, but we have to deepen it. But the university has to recognize. Uh, the forging of these relationships and working together and doing things together, but also to uh, uh, make sure that that's how people are evaluated as well. To hold ourselves accountable. Exactly. We have to write it in somewhere. Exactly. So where do we do that? How do we do that? <laughs> Who's going to be part of that? <laughs> well, but this is, this, so it, the point it's is we have to create it. Right. You see, we have to create it. I mean, you know, Mel King, you know, who, you, who ran for mayor, who was a state rep, he said, you know, sometimes we complain about the dust and have the broom in our hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. uh, and so, you know, that we have to take the initiative. We can't wait for other people to do stuff that we know has to happen, what ha has to happen. And we have to start communicating and talking across disciplines and other departments and say, what could we do? And organize to be able to present it so that we, you know, that we, 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 we build a support around that. So we have to take the initiative. And, and, and I should lift up that um, I saw in the minutes that College of Nursing Health Sciences Faculty Senate brought forward a motion to establish a task force on anti-racism, including student participation, which I think the number should be doubled of students there. Um, so just to lift that up, I'd love to hear other people's ideas and questions. Thank you so much for your response. I think I think also, you know, what I, what I might add to that is that, you know, we have to we have to begin to think critically about the ways in which we include and exclude. You know, what are the what are the things that 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 pull people in, and what are the things that push people out? What are the what are the standards, uh, and what are those standards uplifting? And just just begin to think critically about, you know, what is it that causes us uh, to say that this person should be a nurse, that person should not. This person should get into this graduate school and that person should not. Um, you know, what are we evaluating uh, on the basis of? You know, we've, we've, we've got implicit bias training uh, that takes place uh, in, in a number of, different, number of different ways, but do we also, in, you know, do we also examine um, you know, the policies and the procedures that are in place and look at them with a critical eye towards, you know, how does this turn people away uh, as opposed to draw them in? And, and, and what's the value of that? Um, you know, uh, I, I know everybody uh, in, in higher ed is, is wanting to, um, uh, they, they, they want to be seen and understood as a quality department, a quality institution. Um, but what does quality mean? What, what do we attach uh, uh, quality to when we make those statements? And when we, when we use that term uh, with regard to, to human beings, who are, the in, who are the in crowd and who are the out crowd? Those are always, always issues that I think we need to begin to take a very critical eye towards and determine whether they are useful for us anymore. Or are they holdovers from you know, the 18th, 17th century uh, uh, when we had some very different ideas about who and what a human being is? Are there other questions that are out there? I have a question. I think that one of the biggest problems that we face nowadays in regards to racism is the division that politics causes with everything. Um, do either of you have an opinion on how to approach politics in a less, a less divisive manner? How, how do we bring America back together to get back to what we're supposed to be? To, to, to step forward past racism? Well, Ethan, um, what, what was America before? <laughs> you know, <Not> best. <laughs> you, you, you understand? Um, so, because th there's a, there's a, a, a notion, um, you know, uh, that, you know, I mean, this is, you know, like make America great again. Uh, you know, what is the again part? When you had slavery, uh, you know, uh, you know that you had uh, 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 segregation. That you you have, uh, 
you, you, even today, um, you know, you have uh, suppress, you, where they suppre are suppressing the vote within predominantly black districts uh, and so forth. Um, so the, the idea is that what is the system that allows that to happen? I mean, so you have to change the system. And so, you know, folks say vote. I mean, I, I think voting is important and we all should vote, but you have to keep in mind that during the Montgomery uh, uh, bus boycott, uh, uh, that you had people who were organizing and couldn't vote. I mean, you had high level of organization, uh, you know, in, in, in communities who couldn't vote and who changed things in order, to, you know, for us to be able to vote. So I think that it's a question of how we organize ourselves in ways to oppose uh, the politics uh, that, it, that exists. Uh, you know, within our, our our society, and it's and you know, and it's not it's it's not new. What Trump is doing is not do, new. It's just become more more apparent. Um, and I would say uh, that black people were worse off before. It's just that we've got some privileges, and you know, and most of us got comfortable we have. And so the fact that uh, what what uh, the political leadership is doing is going backwards, right, to a real dangerous place, right. And so it's, again, it's what we will do, how we're going to transform, how are we educating ourselves uh, so that we aren't thinking the way that they're constructing us to think that we're believing their press releases, right? We have to, this is what the institution, education institution should do to help us to become critical thinkers, you know, to be able to analyze and make analysis of what's going on and not just to come and get a piece of paper and get a job, you know, that's perpetuating the system, the status quo. We have to, we have to see education that's going to help liberate us from that type of uh, colonial mentality. Um, I, I, I guess I would say um, that uh, the, the, the polarizing um, uh, sort of environment that the present politics uh, ha has, has, has created um, is to me evidence of a, you know an, an, an increasing tension. Um, and you've got uh, people who want to ignore the reality of, of race um, and say it doesn't matter at all that it's 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 not an issue and that you know it hasn't it doesn't play a role in America um, and you have uh, people who are trying to show and who who I believe are are, are trying to say that it's it it has it always has and it continues uh, to to play a to play a role um, and I think uh, just around this issue of race, um, the, uh, the 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 politics are 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 polarizing, and we're we're not really able to get around it or to get away from it until we until we deal with it and deal with it successfully, and deal with it um, head on. Um, and uh, I think that we are we, while while we may have these ideals about this country uh, being, uh, you know, that the ideals are that we don't have race and that race does not play a role and that race is not an important reality and that uh, everybody is, is, is operating on, on a level playing field. The reality is you know, the people who are most affected by, by race have nothing to do with its construction. Um, and that race itself was created uh, in order to be able to exploit uh, people, to exploit human beings, uh, and to create these, these hierarchies among ourselves so that they could be exploited. And I think until you deal with those realities um, and eliminate it, as uh, a means of structuring uh, society, of structuring jobs, of structuring opportunity, of structuring privilege. Until you do that, um, then the politics are not going to uh, be race-free or get beyond race. 
Um, it's, it's just not going to happen because, um, because uh, what we are trying to build in a democracy uh, is, is a society that is no longer structured by uh, stu structured by race and in which race is not codified into these these uh, these realities where where people um, are by and large by and large being um, uh, being privileged or or not privileged on the basis of the color of their skin so that would be my 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 sense. It's not going to happen until we deal with it as a reality. Are there other questions out there that people have? Can I ask another question, sir? Sure. How would you recommend that? Because I've I've had this the conversation about racism in America with my mother. My mother is an older white woman who lives in the South who just doesn't think that it's a thing anymore. Um, how how do you how do you make someone how do you teach someone that that racism is still very much a large part of what we do every day? Well, you, you know, you in a in a, in in and probably in the best place to to uh, help with the transformation of of your mother, um, because you have a, you have a relationship with her, and so versus you know someone like myself or any ordinary black person, right? Uh, but also recognize it's going to be a process. It's not like you 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 go home and you know, mom, guess what I learned in college today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. It's not going to work like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's through the kind of respected conversations, difficult conversations, you know, uh, that uh, be gets her to, to review her frame of references, the, you know, the values, the way that her perceptual reality in order to think about it differently. Um, and some people, you know, like, for example, if you took a black girlfriend home, you know, you know, she, she, she might want to kick you out, but then she might accept that, but she might have to learn that process of whether it's a black girlfriend, a black boyfriend, or whatever it would be, right? It's a question of, you know, when, when those issues are on the table, to be able to confront those issues with courage and with love, right? Um, because we are who we are and we got it. But the question for us is how do we transform that process? How do we begin to have those difficult struggles and, and so forth where we still care for each other, right? So as, as long as there's room for a discussion, there's room to be able to try to change things, uh, but you have to put it on the table, you have to confront it and you have to ask questions. You know, I don't know if you know who Amiri Baraka is, but he's one of the great black literary poets you know, from Black Arts Movement, he says, you know, if you ask why, you'll get wise. And we have to ask questions of our parents, right? And try to, to sort of deconstruct, you know, how they created that thought, that belief, where did it come from? And, and try to, to help. But the more informed we are, the more we're going to be able to help those around us uh, to deal with some, of, you know, with some of these questions. But you have to educate yourself and you have to continue to ask those questions, uh, you know, and so forth. And you have to be willing to get out of the box that we've been placed in around this notion around race. It's not just race, which is class and gender. And we're talking about a, almost a revolutionary transformation that has to take place, but it's a process. It's not overnight, but you have to have the courage to engage in that process and you have to do it out of love or otherwise, you, you know, it's, it'll just be about, you know, uh, a strife and, 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 and goodbye, mom, I don't want to see you no more. Or goodbye, son, you know, no, mm -hmm. we, we, this, is, this is part of a restorative process as well. It's the healing that has to take place in our families, in our communities, in our societies. But she can't change unless she wants to change. And you have to help her cre create the conditions for her to be willing to change. I don't, I don't know whether, you know, that sometimes a, 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 an indirect approach can help around, around questions like that. I've, I've had 
some very interesting conversations with older white women uh, in, the, in the course of my life uh, around race. Um, and I found that finding the other touch points uh, around um, oppression, are, around social oppression are, are important for helping people to understand. And, you know, uh, I found in, in, on, on occasion, having conversations with them about uh, sexism and the ways that sexism, they, they experienced sexism and the impact it had on them and the way it affected the way that they dreamed about their life and envisioned their life and their opportunities and what opportunities they had and did not have um, and their feelings about those things help to create touch points with what, what, what happens uh, among people of color. Um, but sometimes you have to make those connections for them, uh, uh, for folks who, who come from another generation or who come from an experience where there's just, there's just a, a, a blind spot as it relates to the, the struggle of, of people of color because it's not something you, you relate to. And you know, if she, if she grew up in the South, there's the possibility that she could have spent a significant portion of her life without really ever having to interact with anybody uh, who came from a community of color. So we, we've got to try to make some, point, some touch points with that. And I, I agree with, with, with Dr. Vandermeer here. Um, it, it, creating a, a contentious kind of dialogue often leads to shutdown and you know, people digging in their heels. Um, but if you can make points of connection with people's experience of oppression, and most of us have some of them, um, it, 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 it at least helps to, to move the dialogue in a, in, a, in a different direction. I think Gail had a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you both. Uh, Steve, I thought you were going to talk about me as the uh, old white woman that you had conversations with. <laughs> Um, actually, I, I love talking to you, Steve, but I re this is really directed a little bit more towards Tony because I don't get this opportunity as often. So, um, you know, this, this idea of becoming an anti-racist university is something that I um, have spent a lot of time thinking about. And I, I, when I spend a lot of time thinking about stuff, I usually come up with some pretty good answers. Um, I'm not coming up with them here. And so I guess I... I would love to hear your thoughts. You know, I'm, for those who don't know, I'm the, I'm the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. When I, you know, in my role, and maybe there's some other Vice Chancellors on here, in our roles, what would you like us to, um, how would you like us to go about addressing, how do we get started? Um, you know, this is something, right? Right, this is something. But, um, you know, what are there the, are there the, the low hanging fruit or the really big thing to say, let's go after this? first, this is too important to do low hanging fruit. I just would love you, you, any of your thoughts. Well, I, I would start with, um, uh, start with trying to do the undoing racism training right away, because it creates the dialogue uh, to create a kind of even level of understanding to develop the, the, the language, mm. you know, uh, so we're not just using words and then all of us have different definitions of those words. You know, when I start my class, I start out by saying, well, how do you define racism? And everybody writes this different definitions. So I'm saying, is that, well, how is it that we say this word and we think we mean the same thing, but we have different definitions, right? So I think that that's one of the ways to, to do it. But I also think that to begin to put uh, uh, in play, uh, ways to codify the changes that we want to do to create equity um, uh, and so forth so that we can uh, uh, and, and that's across the board so I would I would make sure that we wouldn't hire another person on this university without going through undoing racism training because that means that we can go through it but then you bring somebody who hadn't been through it and then they will undo what you've been trying to, 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 to undo and make it go back to where it was before, right? That you have to create that process when you bring people in that they, that they are sharing those values 
and that understanding uh, and, and that language uh, to make things happen. Um, and then another thing is that I would, now I've, I've been, a, I've, been a, uh, I've been here for 25 years as a lecturer, as a senior lecturer. And I'll tell you the truth is that um, I, I'm willing to go toe to toe with anybody on this campus. But because of the structure uh, that the resources I receive, the ability to do different things, uh, I, like I, I, I'm overworked and underpaid. Right, I'll say it one more time, I'm overworked and underpaid. But it's not just me. It is a whole bunch of other non-tenure track faculty members who bring great value to this campus. And then to bring somebody else in here because they are doing, you know, for whatever the reasons and not them go through the process and not recognize the value that you have here, right? It's something that we have to do around dealing with equity on this campus. And so, you know, for example, when we negotiate contracts, why is that gotta be contentious? Hmm. Why aren't we trying to find out what's good for this university? Why is it always a question of, of money and maintaining the privilege that already exists with people on this campus? How could we restructure things to make sure that we try to get it right? But it's a process, don't get me wrong. I, I, don't, I don't expect us to wave the wand overnight and say, voila. Mm -hmm. But how do we have this conversation and put truth on the table about this is what we want and this is what it's gonna take for us to make it happen. So I would start with the undoing racism training. I would start making sure that when you hire people that they gotta go through that process, uh, uh, you know, to be part of this community uh, uh, around that. And uh, I would, I would in, in ways to try to listen because, you know, leadership uh, sometimes uh, operate in a different mode and they are not used to um, critique and criticism, even in an academic university like ours where we should be engaged in those kind of things. That they have to really hear uh, what uh, people in other categories, even classes are thinking and saying. And so it has to be constant dialogue and discussion to hear things that people don't want to hear because that means that we have to continue grow and evolve regardless what our position is what our status is you know and we have to you know i had my last class uh last tuesday uh i mean and, and i've been teaching for 25 years it was one of the toughest classes i had why because i had a bunch of young black women who was challenging uh, one of the, the uh, um, articles on Africana womenism versus feminism, and they came hard. I mean, you know, they shut, and I was like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And we got into a, a, a very good debate, but you know what was so beautiful, and I had to recognize, is that they were engaged. They, they had, they were struggling around the idea. They put it on the table. We went back and forth, and we clarified uh, some things. But the idea is that they, they critique that piece. And I said, you sh that, this is what we want you to do is critique it, but also what is, what is the good points that exist in there and how do we expand upon it? And we have to do the same thing. What makes UMass UMass in terms of its identity? We're not Harvard, we're not MIT, we're not BU. Let's be proud of our identity. Let's be proud of who we are. Let's build that, let's work with those relations. But what we do, we wanna play like, and this is my view, like we some other institution, which we're not. Let's be UMass, let's develop the identity that we have and be proud of it. You know. So I would start again, by dealing with the undoing racism training, I would deal with how we hire. I mean, the provost, she said she got 24 people. You know, I, I would have a conversation. I would say, look, no, no, let's re-examine how we're gonna hire those next 24 faculty to come into our university. It's as a beginning. Thank you. There are others who have questions. Yes, I have a question. This is this is Tony Martin. My question question is, as we as we move move forward with with working to undo racism and and the structure structure racism and, and and that kind of stuff. Since this is a university, what are we doing, and how how can how how does this translate practically? Uh, uh, 
to to helping students you know for for example one of the most discouraging uh, you know statistics is is out of a hundred black and brown students only 17 to 19 percent even graduate so where where do the do the other 80 plus go I mean that's you know and and when I hear I hear conversations and and uh, and Dr. Dr. Ven Venemir, man, you are absolutely brilliant. I've you know, I've listened to you and I'm really really you know inspired. But since since this is a university and it comes back to students, what are we doing and and how do we what what kind of commitment moving forward can we can we give to to helping helping those numbers? I know. Um, I know we are working to bring bring my brother's keeper to campus, but beyond that, you know, when it comes to to black black and brown brown men, I don't hear a lot of support. And you know, matter of fact, it seems like we are absolutely silent. We don't say anything. Well, no, I, I mean now. I know, I know there is a a, a black a black men men website, or but beyond that, I would be interested in hearing what we can do to to change some of those statistics. I mean, that's that's really bad, you know. And yet, I don't hear uh, a lot of a lot of noise about that. It's you know, it's as if. It's not. Hurting. It's not important, and and we'll get to it to it when we get to it. Well, I've been here for years, and I don't see us really really getting to it. Now, I've seen I've seen a lot of support. You know, Vice uh, Vice Chancellor Gale has been awesome. Uh, a mentor, you know, relationship ship is there. You know, and I really appreciate that. But what I would appreciate more is we began to figure out how we're gonna change those statistics and it's and it's so bad and we don't even talk about it you know i don't hear about this you know we talk about well we need to we need to to write the ship and do so many other things but what about the black and brown men yeah. you know and even if even if we we could improve the statistics to 20%. That's still 80% of our black and brown men, uh, you know, are going, are going by the wayside. Well, you know, Tony, um, so let, let, me, let me say this because I, I want to be careful how we define we. Um, and I want to say that in the Africana Studies Department is that this has been a question that we have been grappling with since I've been here. Um, and, and, and it raises the question of what role, how does the, the system, the institution, begin to address this question? And I would say that I would go back to CPCS. And CPCS, you know, was completely demolished. Um, but it, 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 it was a competency-based education system. Uh, it had its roots in the community, right, where it brought people here because the idea of students coming to this campus for them to learn, not that they come with a certain set of uh, annoying things, right? Of course, they do bring their own knowledge. Um, and so, but we have to ask this question, if anybody did the research, what was the impact of the decimating that program in terms of what it did in terms of bringing a different cluster of people here, in particular young, uh, young Black men? So this is the role the university could play in terms of its it's responsibility to the community. What are the community agencies uh, uh, out there? Uh, and how are we interfacing with those agencies to work with them and develop programs that's going to be, create portals to be bringing some of those uh, people here, those young men, those young black men um, here, and how do we retain them? What about the work in prison? I've, 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 I've did, uh, you know, since I've been here, I've done work in some of the prisons. At one point, I was director of the Transformational uh, Prison Project, in, in which we would sit in circles with, with men and, and some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, incarcerated men, and have taken people back and forth to deal with some of those men who've, who've since gotten out and come to meet with me on a personal basis so I can help them, you know, stay on track, go to school and do stuff. 
how do we create structures mm -hmm. at our university, right, uh, that uh, try to uh, restore those men who, who, who done harm, who's come out, who's trying to make themselves better and to help better their community. What role do we play as an institution? Now, I, I'm, and I know what you're doing, I think what you're doing is wonderful, but it's about collaborating, looking at what happened. And I mentioned this before about uh, Manny Montero. As, a, uh, as an undergraduate student who used to meet with black men and men of color on a regular basis and had little support. They, of course, they have success Boston now and so forth, you know, in terms of that process, but he did an excellent job. Where's Manny? Go and recruit Manny and to help uh, deal with some of the, uh, the programs in terms of dealing with this. The work that you're doing, support you in that work. Let's have a, a, uh, a, a, a conference or a seminar on how uh, to make this right, to improve this. Uh, but it's with your leadership, other leadership, working in collaboration with other people, you know, uh, getting the deans, getting the provosts, the chancellors, you know, to buy into that, uh, to put that in, 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 in process. But it's going to take our initiative. We can't expect someone else to do it for us. We got to organize that and put the pressure. We got to organize support in the community, right? But it also has to be independent. It's just not, you know, to appease some, some political entity somewhere or here. It has to be authentic. It has to be real. But organize those, those folks. And I'm, I'm with you because I, I know a whole bunch of Black men that would like to go to college. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, uh, but let's create programs that help them. I worked with Jim Adari Kumar, you know, when he was at CPCS, and this was in 1990. We did a, a course at Roxbury Community College, and then we did a course over at a um, uh, 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 Freedom House. And it was a number of Black men who went on and, and, and uh, did undergrad degrees, did, you know, uh, master's degrees. There were also women. Karen Crockett was one of our students. She's going to participate uh, in our next forum with uh, Fania Davis, Angela Davis' sister, uh, as a panelist, who she's the chief equity officer of the city of Boston. She was in that program. Uh, Liz uh, uh, Miranda had participated in some, so I'm saying that we have to create these programs within the community to create portals uh, to bring folks in that the university must support materially. Thank you, Tony. Um, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Can I can I can I jump back in quickly, yeah, it, Doctor it, uh, Doctor Van right. Vandermeer? Um, one of the things Doctor Neville helped me helped me see is you know, and Manny Manny is incredible. I mean, oh my goodness, who who doesn't love Manny? You know, and it's work. But Manny Manny is a personality, and and um, and then when he left, his you know, a lot of what he, what he, what he did left. I think what Dr. Neville has helped me to see is, is we need to institutionalize something. And I know, I know success Boston is in fact doing some, doing some things, but, um, you know, I mean, I, you know, I celebrate Manny and I probably, you know, we talk and text every day. I want something though, that's going to be really for, for us and for the, university you know and and when i'm uh, when i'm gone it, it, you know it won't be well tony tony did this tony tony disappears in the dust and that's great but if we have programs and things and uh, you know that's you know that's there for that the goes, university that goes, that goes to your point uh and to right. the point that steve read about codifying is that we have to build these into structures right so out of personalities and, and i agree you know because right. you're a personality i'm a personality steve, but what structure do we 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 create so it perpetuates it continues yeah. and but we have to pull in uh these people who made contributions that did this in terms of the ideas so that we uh, we can learn from those experiences and, mm -hmm. and institutionalize what you're talking about, you know, within our university. So I agree with that, Tony. And I, I think we also have to, um, we have to put pressure, bring pressure to bear as to what's, what's priority. Because the institution is going to institutionalize what is a priority to it. And I think if if there needs to be more of us who are saying our black and brown men, right. uh, our black and brown students right. need to have the structures in place that are going to support their success. 
And, and uh, Steve, to your, Steve, to your point mm -hmm. about the, 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 the universe will put in those structures, this is why we have to uh, have these conversations because most of the time it's coming from a white supremacist orientation. It's coming from, you mm -hmm. know, out of whiteness, which is a false construct and out of power. And we mm -hmm. have to shift that, but yeah. we can't shift that with rhetoric. We have to shift that with being organized and bringing pressure to bear with the community and, mm -hmm. and with colleagues and with students to say, this is the universe we want. We have to change what already exists. So we got to struggle with the, with the Board of Trustees. We got to struggle with the state legislature. We have to struggle across the board, you know, with, with faculty members, you know, on our campus so that we can develop, you know, a, uh, a focus on transforming this university that, that, uh, that, that honors all of our humanity and create equity for all of us. Okay, I'm going to have to cut in here because we're going to have to we have to close this session. I know there were others that 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 have 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 questions, but we need to transition and get ready for the next session. I want to thank Dr. Vandermeer for uh, uh, giving us uh, some some of his time and an opportunity to really engage with him. I want to thank you all for coming and being a part of this conversation and ask you just continue it. Again, this is just about setting the foundation. I really just want you to continue to have this conversation and raise it uh, in the UMass Boston community and the community at large. So thank you all. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna close and, and set up the next one. Thank you again.